as we turn our Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 10. We're going to be looking at a kind of a lengthy passage this morning, uh, but uh, kind of briefly in a way as well. We're in a series of messages on accelerating our spiritual growth called Right Now. And the premise to the whole series of messages is this, is that whatever God wants you and I to do, we need to do it right now. And if we don't do it right now, we won't do it at all. Now, I know that I, I'm going to get some feedback about that, so let me just cut, you know, just cut to the chase right now. I know that there are exceptions to that rule. I, I do know that. I do know that some of you can put things off and later come back and do them, but that is the rare exception. And we should never think and presume upon God that we're always the exception to the rule. The rule is basically this, and I'm sure it's true with 90, 95% of us. When God lays something on your heart to do, and he wants you to do that right now, if you don't do it now, you won't do it at all. And it's so true with the whole action of prayer as well. There are 8,200 books, in fact, over 8,200 books written on the subject of prayer. If you were to uh, study any survey in America when it comes to prayer, you would find out that most people not only pray some, a little at least, they, they say they do, but also they believe that God answers prayer. So the question is, why don't we do that more often? The Bible says in Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Now I know that almost all of us here have great intentions. I have good intentions about prayer, and you do as well. But as we said last week, good, intended, uh, good intentions do not get rewarded. And so why don't we call upon him? You say, well, I, I do. I sort of pray on the run, you know, and I, I pray when I can. And that's true. Most of us do that. But where is that life-changing, revival, world-altering type of prayer that the Bible speaks about, those mighty and hidden things that we don't know about? Where is that kind of prayer today in our world? The Bible says in James 4, 2, James says you don't have because you simply do not ask. Now, I gave this illustration a little bit last week, so I'm going to start off with this this week. That is to say, what if, what if five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, whenever it was, God laid it on your heart first to really pray? If you would have started then, I'm not just talking about just a prayer list, I'm talking about getting close to God, getting getting in, uh, face, have face time with God and really make a difference and lay hold to the, the throne of grace as we've heard it preached so often. If you were to have done that back then, what would your life be like today? How would, how would it be different today? How many answers to prayer would you have? And so with that thought in mind, I want us to turn to Luke chapter 10 and 11. And as we look at this passage, I want to read a verse to you to start off with where it says in verse 1, it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. Notice the disciples did not say, Lord, teach us to preach. Lord, teach us to, uh, teach, us to teach, teach us to heal. No, they said teach us to pray. Because just like us, they had the same struggles even back in the New Testament times when they were walking with Jesus. Can you imagine them walking along with Jesus and how many times they had it in their mind to even to ask Jesus for something right then, and they didn't do it? How many times did that happen? He said, Lord, Lord, teach us to pray. And in the original Greek language, the idea is, Lord, teach us to pray now. There's a desperation here involved in their request. And so as we look at this, I want to break it down logically. I want us to see why we should pray, and then secondly, why we don't pray, and thirdly, what's the solution? In other words, I want to look at the value, the vacuum, and the victory involved in this. First of all, the value of praying. As we look at this passage, I want us to look at Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 38, as we sort of set this up. This is the visit of Mary, uh, Mary and Martha. Now, 
uh, Mary and Martha were very close to Jesus. If you remember the story in John chapter 11, they lived in Bethany, and this was the same Mary and Martha who had a brother by the name of Lazarus. Now, what did, they, what did Jesus do with Lazarus? What, what, somebody tell me. He raised him from the dead. And so they were very tight. Uh, to, he was very tight with his family. He was teaching even Mary and Martha then in John chapter 11 about the resurrection. He is the resurrection and the life. And so as he's traveling along, he's visiting Mary and Martha again. In fact, maybe this is, it seems like this is one of his, his homes that he normally visited, sort of a base of operations in this area. And here's what it says in verse 38. Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all the preparations, and she came uh, up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mar Mary rather has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. I want you to notice there's four things in this passage that we're looking at this morning. Number one, one of the values of prayer, in fact, the number one value of prayer is intimacy with God. Now, Mary was at the feet of Jesus. She was worshiping. She was listening to his word. Martha was very busy working. I want you to notice a couple of things about this passage that maybe you've missed, you and I have missed before. Number one is that Mary was working. Look in verse 40, it says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me? And so Mary was working with Martha, but she, she shut down kind of early and went and sat at the feet of Jesus and began to worship and listening to his word. Then I want you to notice that Martha was praying. So where do you get that? Well, look, look right here. It says, tell her to help me. Now, he, he said no to that prayer, by the way. But he said, uh, you know, she was praying. Lord, don't you care that I'm just in this all by myself? I'm just working my fingers to the bone. And here, uh, Mar Mary is quitting. Somebody's got to do this job and do this task. And tell her to help me, Lord. Now, if you'd have answered that prayer, well, we do. well, Mary, get up. You know, don't be so lazy and get over there and help your, your sister. No, he said no because... That was not the best thing. I want you to notice is these two ladies had a different perspective on who Jesus was and what he was about. The Bible says that Martha was serving Jesus. Jesus said, I, I didn't come here to be served. I came to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. Mary was working, knocked off early, and she began to pray. Now, we notice here that Mary was working, Martha was praying, just like... Both of them were doing both things, but both had different priorities in life. Martha wanted to get the task accomplished. Mary's number one priority was face time with Jesus. Martha was active, but there was no relationship involved. Now, folks, we, we know people, I've known people all my life that would work their, take 10 jobs in the church rather than come to worship or go to a small group. They just don't want the intimacy. They don't want the closeness. They don't want that kind of relationship. In my last church, we had a guy that volunteered for everything on Sunday morning to stay out of, he stayed out of small groups, he stayed out of worship. And, and you know how the leaders were. Yeah, we need somebody so bad in this area. Yeah, come on and help us out. Come on and help us out. He very seldom ever attended. He wanted to do the task, but he did not want the intimacy we find with God. Now, to some degree, there are really two different types of Marthas in the church. The first type of Martha is the one that does not have a relationship with God at all. You know, maybe they grew up in church and they were surrounded. They're, they're affected by their, their environment, all right? They're, they're, they're in a worship environment. They're in a church environment. They grew up in youth group and then maybe in a college group and there's Christians all around them, but once they get out on their own, there's no intimacy there. There's no relationship there. They can become, they look like they're good, they look like Mary's, but they're really Martha's. And when they, their environment changes, they change with their environment. But there's a second type of Martha's, and 
maybe you're one of them this morning, and that is your prayer life used to be really good, but now, you know, well, for lack of a better term, it kind of stinks right now. And you're, you're more concerned about doing work than you are intimacy. Well, men like, are like that oftentimes. You know, we want to make such a good living for our family. We, we go everywhere. We travel everywhere. We work our fingers to the bone, you might say, 16, 12, 16 hours a day and neglect the intimacy with our family when that is the most important thing. Intimacy with God. You know, one of the things that I, I kind of thought about to myself, and that is about heaven. Just for, just, I'm just going to throw this in. About heaven, think about it. We, we're still looking forward to being in heaven. We know it's not going to be playing the harps and all those kind of things. We're going to be with Jesus. And it occurred to me, you know, God, if I'm going to enjoy heaven, if my church is going to enjoy heaven, if most Christians are going to enjoy heaven, we've got to learn to enjoy worship and prayer a whole lot more than we enjoy it today. Do I have an amen? amen. Do I have an oh me? <laughs> more oh, uh, more amens than oh me's. But here we find there's a fear here of intimacy with God. Now, a disciple is one who is called into an intimate relationship with the Lord. But we fear that. We run from that. And you say, well, that's sort of not in my DNA. I wasn't raised that way. You know, it just wasn't... Uh, what I was all about. But you know, it really reminds me of what happened back in the Old Testament. When Moses uh, was going to go up into the mountain, and it, the mountain was so awesome, and you could tell the presence of God was there, and the Israelites said, you know, Moses, you, you go ahead and you, know, you, you get the ten words and all that, and we're just going to hang back here at the camp, you know, we're going to watch the kids. You know, I don't want to get too close to God. But the difference between the Israelites and us, dear friend, that, that veil in the temple that separated the Old Testament saints from God has been torn by the cross of Jesus Christ. You and I have been saved in order to have this type of relationship with God, this intimacy with God. And one of the reasons why we fret so much and stress so much and we're, we feel like, you know, you know, somebody else, pastor, you're going, or missionary, you're going to go up to the mountain and get the Ten Commandments. You're going to get close to God, and I'll pray for you as I go and we're sitting back at the camp, stressed out, worried about every single thing in life. You want to know how to get over worry. All right, I'm going to tell you. Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. You want to be encouraged instead of discouraged. You want to have courage in your Christian walk, in your Christian faith. You need strength. Where are you going to get that? The joy of the Lord. Where are you going to get the joy of the Lord? Psalm 16.11 says... You will make known to me the path of life, and your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. The presence of God, the, the feeling, the sense of oneness with God. In fact, Charles Stanley has said it best when he said, the greatest thing about prayer is a sense of oneness with God. Do you feel that oneness today? What's the value of prayer? It's intimacy with God. But secondly, it's also not only the blessings, but also a surrender to God. Notice what happens here in verse 2 of chapter 11. When, when the disciples asked them, he said, Lord, teach us to pray. He says, Father, hallowed be thy name. Father. A sense of intimacy, but also a sense of surrender as well. One of the odd things about the New Testament that I find kind of different and insightful is the fact that Jesus addressed God as my father in every single instance in some way or fashion in the New Testament except for one. Every single time that he began to pray, he addressed him as my father. And when he addressed him as my father, he was saying, I am under your authority while I'm here on earth. And every time we pray and we say, my Father, every time we humble ourselves and pray, we recognize the fact that we cannot do things on our own. You, I know you're wondering, what is the one time? <laughs> you know, I'm going to leave you hanging on that one. No, the one time that Jesus did not address the Lord as my Father was on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he took on your sins and mine. He was still his Father, but now he had to to put a different light to it altogether because he was taking on 
our sins on himself. But this whole idea of intimacy and the, and the Father, and here we find even in the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, as it's called, at least the model prayer, talks all, begins by saying, my Father, Jesus addressing him as saying, I am surrendered to you. Every time I think about the fact that I'm praying, it's a hum humility factor. I'm humbled before the Lord. He says, look, look at these verses. He says, Thy, your kingdom come. Now, in the Matthew's rendition of the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer uh, is a little bit more extensive than this. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is, what is he praying for here? Jesus is praying for, first of all, your kingdom come, your rulership. I pray that your rulership would come on this earth, and I'm praying that the world will be at rest. I'm praying that the world will be at rest. Then, when he says, your will be done, he's praying that my heart will be at rest about the world. How many of us watch the news and fret over everything that's going on around us? We fret about our borders. We fret about immigrations. We, we fret about the moral issues of our nation. We fret about the economy. We fret about, maybe, uh, hopefully, people coming to know Christ and your relatives and your friends not, not knowing him. We maybe fret about the, the church of some, in some way, some form, and the dying influence in the church that you, we feel like is going on in, our, um, uh, in the world today. We fret about all kinds of things. And Jesus said, look, you humble yourself before me and surrender yourself to me in prayer, and in this humility, you pray that the rulership of God will be upon this earth, that this world will be at rest, and then you pray your heart will be at rest in the condition the world is in, trusting God with it. Wouldn't you like to have that this morning? He said there's a surrender here to God. That's one of the great values. Surrendering our hearts, humble before the Lord, and knowing I can do nothing of myself. John 15, 5 says... I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him. He bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. It's an admission every time I pray, God, I can do nothing without you. But then the blessings of God. We could read on in verse 3. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins. We, we look at some uh, a story here. Then he said in verse 5, suppose one of you had a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. From inside, he answers and says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say unto you, Ask, and it will, it will be given to you. Not seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you again. For everyone who asks, receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be open. God is saying here, Jesus is saying to us, you ask, you ask, you ask, and the things that you ask for, many of them you would never receive, ever receive, unless you were asking. You don't have because you don't ask. Ran across this little uh, sermon, and uh, you can even find a little outline of it on the internet, Jonathan Edwards, who was one of the preachers, great preachers during the first great, great awakening in America back a couple of centuries ago, was best known for his sermon on sinners in the hands of an angry God. It's a very world famous uh, sermon. But his first sermon at the age of about 18 or 19 was called Christian Happiness. Now, when you think about the blessings of God, you think, oh, you know, woe is me. I've got all these problems on me, and I'm stressing out, and I'm worrying, and I'm not giving them to God. I'm, oh, yeah, yeah, I could be praying. But we think to ourselves sometimes when we worry and stress and fret, we, we're praying, and we're not. But here's his sermon real quick on, um, on Christian happiness based on Romans 8. He says, we, we, three reasons why Christians ought to be happy. It's a good sermon outline. Three reasons why Christians ought to be happy. Number one, our bad things will turn out good. Our good things will never be taken away. And number three, the best things are yet to come. 
Isn't that great? And that's so true. The blessings of God in our life. But then fourthly, the wisdom of God. In, Mary, in Mary's case, it says she has chosen the good part. One of the things I noticed in some of the other gospels, particularly the gospel of Matthew, was the fact that when G Mary was there at Jesus' feet, she anointed Jesus' feet, and then Judas Iscariot, uh, the betrayer of Jesus, then protested that. But then Jesus said this, don't, don't rebuke her. She is anointing me for my burial. Now, of all the people that were in that room, certainly the disciples, the 12, and there was Martha, and there was Mary, and probably Lazarus was there as well, and probably a few other people as well, some neighbors around. That, that's the way they lived back then. Neighbors were in there, maybe a house filled with people. There was only one person that was listening to Jesus. One, Mary. That was it. She is the one that had the wisdom of God. Why? Because she was taken off the blinders. The disciples had blinders on, and all they could think about, if this was the Messiah, if this is the Messiah sitting before us, he is going to be a military ruler. They had those blinders on. That's the way they, that's the story that they had told themselves. They've been telling themselves that story, and nothing really could break into that story. Jesus just really got in their face and said, I'm going to die on the cross. I mean, what? You, you look at this temple. This temple is going to be raised up on the third day. They still didn't hear it. But Mary heard it because she was sitting at the feet of Jesus, and the only place that you can get that kind of insight and wisdom is along with God. So why don't we pray more? Well, let's look very quickly at the vacuum. The disciples were struggling. What is it? Well, there's a lack of humility. There is. I mean, we, we, it's a very unnatural thing to pray. Well, every time I pray, I, I, I admit to myself that I can't do it on my own, that I'm not as good as I think I am. Every time I pray, I, I have to rely upon God. Now I have to take it out of my hands and give it to God. Therefore, it's no longer about believing in myself and my own talent, my own ability. Now I have to humble myself before God as I did at the cross at salvation. And every time I pray, I admit to myself, God, I cannot do it. You are the vine. I am the branches. I cannot do anything without you. There's a lack of humility. There's a, there's a laziness, I think, in prayer. There is. Because... Because prayer is hard work. People say, well, we need to pray in order to prepare for the big work. No, prayer is the big work. It is, it is the hard work. Listen, I, I don't know. I, when I'm preaching, for example, I never daydream in my own sermon. I never go to sleep. You do, but I don't. <laughs> and you daydream, but I don't. I, I'm, I'm preaching. But boy, I can sure daydream when I'm praying. I got 15 minutes later, I'm thinking, where did I get off thinking about this? And I start tracing my thoughts back, and, well, it was a prayer request that got me off, and I thought about how I'm going to handle that problem that day, and daydreaming. There's spiritual warfare going on, and therefore, since it's hard work, it's just easier not to do it, to send up a quick prayer. There's doubt, another reason. We, we have the hidden and searchable things. And we think, oh, yeah, but God says yes sometimes and no sometimes and wait sometimes. Well, listen, whether we admit it or not, God says yes a lot more than what we think he does. You pray for strength every day, God gives it to you. You pray for safety every day, and God gives you that. You pray over your food every day, and I I'm a personal witness to the fact that he has blessed that food to the nourishment of my body. And uh, I'm sure you can testify to the same thing. God answers our prayer with yes most of the time. But sometimes there is a no. He told Mary, no. Why? He said, Mary, I am not going to play in to your task-oriented life where the task is more important than me. I'm not going to encourage that. Mary's doing the best thing. Now, if Mary would have turned around and said, you know, Jesus... You know, let, let's just have bread and water and, and make Mary sit down here and listen. He may have an, answered that prayer, but he's not going to go the opposite way. He's not going to play into Mary's or Martha's idolatry and worshiping, in a sense, the work that she does so she can impress God and feel better about herself. And so sometimes 
he does say no for our own good. And so there's doubt. And then sometimes we just don't feel like we're getting an answer. And sometimes there, there's spiritual warfare. And sometimes there's busyness. And by the way, you don't always want to get every prayer answered. You, you don't. Because sometimes it can be bad for you. Like the mouse that died and went to heaven. He said, Lord, if you just give me some roller skates, my legs are so tired. And a cat died the next day. He said, well, if I just had a soft pillow to lay on. And so the angel came by the next day and said to the, asked the cat, how's the pillow? Is everything good? He said, oh, this is, this is really heaven. This is the softest pillow in the world. By the way, the Meals on Wheels was a nice touch as well. So you don't always want your, your prayers answered. But look at the victory in this prayer. He says, for everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and he who knocks, it will be opened. He says in verse 13, to those who ask him now. Right now. Now what if you had done something 5, 10, 15 years ago? Well, you can't do anything about that now. You can't say, yeah, I wish I'd really started praying back then. Boy, my life would have really been changed. But what would happen if you started now, praying now? What would your life look like? Some of the prayers even in the, offered in the Bible. We could offer some of these prayers to God every day. What about the prayer, the famous prayer of Jabez, where it says, Now Jabez called upon the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my border, that your hand might be upon me, that you would keep me from harm, that it might not bring me pain. And God gave him his request. That God put an impact in your life, that you could make an impact for God. And you started praying that now. Just think about the impact you can make on the lives of other people. The success. So many people are worried about America today. What about in Genesis 18 where Abraham prayed that God would spare the city of Sodom if he could find 10 righteous people? Well, he couldn't find them. But if he had found 10 righteous people, he would have saved the whole city for those 10, not for those 10 righteous, because of the prayer of Abraham. What would our nation be like so, so differently if we'd have started praying 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. But what difference could we really make today if we started right now? What about some of the prayers of like Hezekiah? Somebody says, well, I'm praying for healing. Well, in Isaiah 38, 16, the Bible says that Hezekiah prayed for a healing and God healed him and gave him years to his life. The, one of the prayers of David was over his family. Praise the Lord. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord who greatly delights in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. You're praying for your kids. What difference in your life it could make to your family if you were to start praying right now. Not wait till tomorrow. I'll put it off till tomorrow. I'll do it next week. Yeah, I need to start. No, right now, what difference it could make to the people that you love the most. What about the, one of the prayers of Paul? Say, well, I'm, I'm just so discouraged. I'm so dismayed about everything. Listen to this. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints? You want to be encouraged? You want to be blessed? You want to have insight? You want to be enlightened to the word of God? Start praying now. What about Paul's prayer for power and to know the love of Christ? which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God, that you prayed this every day and you were filled with the fullness of God, how God could use you in a powerful way if you were to start now, right now. What about Jesus? John 17, he prayed, The glory which you have given me I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, and they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and, and love them, even as I have loved you. Boy, if we start praying that now, the prayer of Jesus now, and the unity of the body and the rest of the world would look and say, wow, don't they magnify Christ? Well, they're not only agreeing on some things, but they're agreeing on their mission. They, they know what they're about. You never have to wonder. They love one another. 
And what about evangelism and missions? Jesus said, he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. How many workers, how many more workers than we even have right now going out into the harvest and gleaning the fields, not, not just on the foreign mission field, not just in different places in America, but right here in our own backyard. How many, some, some of your small groups, you haven't had join, somebody to join the small group in a year? Some of you five years, some of you 10 years, perhaps. What about that? If you were to start praying, God, send out laborers into the harvest, even from our class, even me, God, that you would do something in my life a year from now. Would, how, how different your class would look. How different the church would look if we prayed the prayer that Jesus prayed. Here's the thing. Mary had the right priority. Face time with Jesus. That took precedent over anything else, including food, including service. Face time with Jesus. If you're going to do it, you've got to do it now. God laying that on your heart today, you need to do it now. So here's the thing. The devil doesn't care what you do as long as you do it tomorrow. So what about us? Ezekiel tells us, I searched for a man among them, God says, who would build up the wall and stand in the gap, praying, standing in the gap before me for the land, so that I would not destroy it, but I found no one. Is that going to be your plight, our plight, our legacy? Or Psalm 116, a better description of our future? Where David said, I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer of mercy. Because he bends down to listen. I will pray as long as I have breath. So I, I, I pray today. I ask you today. Is this not something God wants you to do? And then, if he wants you to do that, should you not start today? Should you not start right now at the altar this morning? So I'm kind of embarrassed about coming to the altar. A humility. If, you, if, you're not, if you're not willing to do that, kneel or stand or something, then maybe you're not willing to, to really humble yourself before God and ask him for things that you cannot provide because you think somehow, some way, I'll find a way to do it myself. Start now. Start today. Because the Bible, just like when we were saved, remember that? You did it right then. Oh, you may have put it off for a while because the Holy Spirit kept drawing you and drawing you more and more and more. But there came a time where you just knew this was it. Now's the time. And maybe that's your prayer today. And Mary knew that it began with a relationship with Christ. And so she was at his feet. And this morning, that begins for you right at the feet of Jesus. So if you've never been saved, you don't have that relationship. And if that's the prayer that you have today, I would encourage you to pray with me this prayer right now. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If that's the prayer of your heart, you want Jesus to come to live inside your heart, you come, or rather, you, you pray with me now. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for going to the cross and dying for my sins. I open up the door of my heart I ask you to come in. Forgive me of all my sins. I follow you now with my life. In Jesus' name. Salvation was the start of my prayer life. He challenged me to write down my prayer requests and seeing prayers answered um, has completely changed my life. I am who I am today because of God's encouragement to me to write down my prayer requests and then have the blessing of getting to see them answered and seeing the written evidence where it was undeniable that God was at work increased my faith, it increased my love for Him, that a God so big and wonderful would care about me for the little things um, all the way up to the big things. 
uh, another thing happened and that was that I was able to share my faith in a way that I couldn't before because I was too afraid. But after seeing prayers answered, I couldn't not tell other people what God was doing. Um, God also showed me a way of looking for Him and recognizing Him in Scripture. And as I would read Scripture, it, I felt like God was just showing me all the ways that He loves me and that He's there and helped me to get to know Him that way. And so my prayers started changing even furthermore into focusing on God and what I love about Him. And um, I was able to have times of great adoration for Him ultimately has brought me to a place of joy where Jesus is my top focus knowing um, in Psalm 37 4 he tells us to delight ourselves in the Lord and he will give us the desires of our heart and I used to think that meant if I was delighting myself in God I'd get my way but he taught me that when I'm del delighting myself in him that he puts those desires in my heart and then he satisfies them and that is far greater than any prayer request that I can make on my own. And so I know how to always get my prayers answered with a yes, and that is to always pray for God's will because He always knows better than I do, and He promises to bring good about to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose, so I can rest in that. And I, I know that prayer ultimately does just bring me joy as you focus on Jesus Christ.